Many historians and peers have characterized Sergeant Shriver as an idealist and a Boy Scout. However, he was never able or allowed to achieve a high enough political office to carry out his own ideas. But Sergeant Shriver can hardly be considered a political failure, as his bid for the nation's second highest political office is not even atop his list of accomplishments. Through Shriver's marriage into the Kennedy family, along with his own impressive political prowess, he was catapulted to the top of Washington politics, taking on society's toughest problems like poverty and apathy. Shriver's role in John F. Kennedy's campaign, the Peace Corps, the War on Poverty, and Special Olympics demonstrate his idealist actions that have left a legacy of service and hope. On November 9, 1915, Robert and Hilda Shriver gave birth to their second son, Robert Sargent Shriver, at their home in rural Maryland. Sarge had three loves growing up, religion, politics, and baseball. The two former came overtly from his mother, Hilda. She was a strong progressive woman who convinced her husband to convert to both Catholicism and the Democratic Party, and she made sure that her sons were raised in the same fashion. Shriver's idealism comes as no surprise given his upbringing. To Sarge, who learned about social justice from the Catholic Church, involvement in community service and convincing others to do the same came naturally. Sarge was scarred when he saw his family lose its fortune in the Great Depression, and it would later spur his fight against poverty. While Shriver attended Yale, it was possible because of scholarships. After he graduated, Sarge joined the Navy and served in World War II, and while he was eager for more action, he saw enough to convince him that America should avoid war at all costs. All these experiences left deep marks with Sarge and helped to guide his future actions. After the war, Shriver went to New York where he worked for Newsweek, but it wasn't long before Joseph P. Kennedy offered him a job in Chicago. While Sarge was one of Kennedy's managers, he also became Joe's son-in-law, marrying Eunice Kennedy in May 1953. Sarge quickly rose through the ranks of Chicago politics, becoming president of the Catholic Interracial Council and the school board. In these positions, Shriver expanded the school system's budget and played a huge role in desegregating the schools. So it came as no surprise that in 1960, many people encouraged Shriver to run for governor. But with JFK making a bid for the White House, Shriver's nomination put too many Catholics and too many Kennedys on the ballot. Not wanting to risk losing the electorally important state of Illinois for his son, Joe Kennedy ordered Sarge not to run and to instead focus on JFK's campaign. On the campaign, Sarge was put in charge of the Civil Rights Division and securing the black vote. The delicate balance candidates had to maintain between civil rights leaders and white segregationists made Sarge's job particularly difficult. But he was truly tested when, two weeks before the election, Martin Luther King was jailed in Georgia for protesting a segregated restaurant. In the heat of a presidential election, the nation watched and waited to see if either candidate would take a stand against this injustice or stay neutral to gain support of Southern whites. But against the judgment of most of Kennedy's advisors, Shriver made sure that the Kennedy camp supported King. He alone convinced JFK to call Coretta Scott King in a show of moral, if not also political, support. This one action had a profound impact on the ensuing 10 days. Civil rights leaders were largely supporting Nixon because he was Protestant. But because Kennedy reached out to the King family, many, including King's father, switched their support. Prominent black leaders delivered Kennedy thousands of votes, and come election day, JFK won 70% of the black vote, securing the election. While Sarge didn't deliver the win, the actions he took based on his core ideals solidified JFK's victory. But it was during the campaign that another event would change the course of Shriver's career. Taking root from a speech that JFK gave in Ann Arbor, Michigan, the Peace Corps would soon begin to blossom under Shriver's stewardship. After months of task force meetings and reading and writing reports on the feasibility of a Peace Corps, the Senate confirmed Shriver as its director. It wasn't long before Shriver and his team cut through the government's bureaucratic red tape and made something from nothing. But their troubles were far from over. While President Kennedy liked the idea of the Peace Corps, especially as a way for America to reach out to third world nations, he was being pressured to make it an agency within the State Department. Shriver eventually won independent status with some help from Vice President Lyndon Johnson and then set about putting his bill through Congress. After getting eight countries to agree to receive Peace Corps volunteers, Shriver and his team took Capitol Hill by storm. Facing opposition from Washington veterans, Shriver and his friend Bill Moyers met with almost every member of Congress personally. Their unique approach to legislating yielded more permanent funding, and on August 29, 1961, the first Peace Corps volunteers went to Africa. Shriver projected his idealism on the Peace Corps and its staff, 
trying to meet and train new volunteers personally so they could realize his passion for the Peace Corps and do their job with the same fervor. In just under six years, Shriver developed programs in 55 countries with more than 14,000 volunteers. And while Shriver intended to continue growing the Corps, somebody else had a different job in mind. Lyndon Johnson and Sergeant Shriver got to know each other well over the course of the Peace Corps' infancy. So when Johnson succeeded to the presidency, Sarge was on his shortlist for the vice presidency. But once again, Shriver's career took a backseat to Kennedy family ambitions. But Johnson soon picked Shriver to be the commander-in-chief for the war on poverty. But I am going to make it clear that you missed poverty. The home and abroad, you ought to be. Despite Shriver's initial hesitancy, he became committed to the war once he realized that half of those living in poverty were children. Shriver soon got to work heading the Office of Economic Opportunity, or OEO, which gave way to programs such as VISTA, Head Start, Youth Corps, Upward Bound, and Shriver's own brainchild, Community Action. We depend completely on local communities to come to Washington with their own programs. With Shriver's passion and his urging youth into the politics of service, the war on poverty escalated quickly and was able to reach 3 million people within a year. But local politicians became very angry that community activists were able to use federal money to sue local governments. Under extreme pressure, Sarge was forced to close the doors of some programs. While Sarge was faced with the betrayal of many local activists, he had a more pressing concern, to make sure the war on poverty was going to remain funded with America deeply embattled in Vietnam. Vietnam just must be the center of our concern. By the time Congress renewed funding, Shriver was weary of fighting and was ready to run for Senate in Illinois. But in the politically important year of 1968, Johnson appointed Shriver to be the French ambassador to help negotiate peace talks with Vietnam. Shriver played an important role in politics from 1968 onward, being considered for vice president in 68 and making it onto the ticket in 1972 with George McGovern. In his later years, Shriver would join in the fight of the Cold War, placing the weight of the Catholic Church against the nuclear arms race. But Shriver was far from finished with his career. In 1986, when Eunice Kennedy Shriver decided she wanted to make Special Olympics an international affair, she only knew one person suited to lead the effort. Special Olympics had always been something of a family affair, as Eunice started it at the Shriver's Maryland home. She brought in buses of mentally handicapped children and set up physical activities for them all around the backyard. While Shriver was initially skeptical about her endeavor, he soon became an ardent supporter, and when Eunice recommended that the board elect Sarge president in 1984, they did. Sarge's job was to use his experience both in international diplomacy and building up new programs to launch Special Olympics onto the world stage. Sarge was very successful in convincing countries to start their own Special Olympics chapters. In 1985, Dublin hosted the first European Special Olympics. That same year, countries from Austria to Yugoslavia joined the Special Olympics. Many third world countries in Eastern Europe joined toward the end of the Cold War, as did the Soviet Union before its collapse. In June of 2003, Sarge was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, but his legacy of service has never died out. To date, almost 200,000 Peace Corps volunteers have served in 68 different countries, and the Corps is still growing. From 1964 to 1968, a third of Americans left poverty behind as a direct result of Shriver's efforts in the Office of Economic Opportunity. Community action helped tens of thousands of blacks and Latinos gain political training. Head Start benefited 23 million children and helped thousands of women enter the workforce. Legal services helped invent poverty law. Special Olympics has torn down barriers for mentally handicapped children and catalyzed community building in almost 200 countries. Local organizations like the Shriver Center still carry on Shriver's legacy of service. Within 100 years from now, uh, the Peace Corps and Head Start and, War and the Special Olympics will be seen as kind of examples of the you know, Shriver way, which is you know, taking these sort of, um, there are various ways of putting it, but you know, at the simple level, taking you know, these incredibly idealistic, you know, arguably naive and utopian dreams and then um, putting them into action. And, um, you know, his ability to not only dream big, but then execute big. There should be little doubt that Sergeant Shriver both dreamed and executed big. <laughs>